When we took a look at how Citizens was going to grow over time, it was going to be through building capabilities to deliver excellent experiences to our customers. We're speaking with Beth Johnson. She is the Chief Experience Officer of Citizens Financial Group. Beth, tell us about Citizens. Citizens is one of the largest and oldest financial institutions in the United States. We are a full service bank. We're about 180 billion in assets. So we're, you know, we're quite a large financial services company. Your chief experience officer, which is kind of an unusual title. So so tell us about that and, and tell us about your role. When you think about, you know, banking, it, it's kind of interesting. Our product is really money. But it's very hard to differentiate from a product perspective for any length of time or differentiate with things like pricing. And we know that what our customers really value is experience. So we launched the team and and I launched in the role as the uh, chief experience officer to really build those capabilities. So it includes leading our digital transformation. And I know we're going to talk about that soon, our digital team as well as our data and analytics, which is a critical component to any digital transformation, marketing, um, and some emerging enterprise payments work to try to think about that industry, as well as agile transformation, kind of the how we, uh, we deliver all those capabilities for our customers across our different business units. The thing that I found fascinating about your role is the fact that you combine digital transformation and customer experience together. But let's let's parse this and and why don't we start with customer experience? So what does that mean for you? For me, it is all about delivering for the individual against their need and having deep understanding, not necessarily of what customers say their needs are, but what their needs are based on how they behave and how they act and then designing experiences around that. So we've invested in things like human-centered design capabilities, influenced by our digital capabilities, but really to get at that, how do we understand what our customers need, what they need throughout their uh, lives or their business life cycles, and how do we make sure Citizens is there to be that trusted partner over time uh, for our clients and our customers? So, Beth, then the components of customer experience, uh, how do you how do you define that and how do how do the pieces fit together? We think about it in a couple of different ways. As I said, I think there's some sort of just tactical understanding of customer needs. So how do we make sure we have the listening post? posts in place. We are a net promoter uh, score shop to have listening posts to just hear day in, day out, what are our customers thinking about citizens? And then how do we get that information into the hands of our uh, frontline employees if they're dealing with customers, into our product leads if they're designing new products, our experience owners who we have that are um, helping to design experiences for those customers. So we have a a pulse on our customers at all time. And and we've invested in tools to do that, like a mobile app app internally that we branded Citizens Listens to be able to listen to our customers. But it's it's much more than that. On top of it, it is then those deep design capabilities to think about how do we help um, get into the nitty gritty, whether it's digital transformation or new technologies or training in our branches or in our content development efforts for commercial bankers around M&A. How do we make sure we have the knowledge we need to know that what we're developing makes sense? So a big part then of what you're doing, it sounds like, is uh, gathering feedback from the customers and then developing mechanisms to bring that back inside the organization so that you can then adapt accordingly. I I think that's right. But for an innovative company like ours, which we strive to be, and we have a goal around innovation, it's both understanding those needs and getting feedback, but then having the deep test and learn capabilities to see, is it resonating? Is it working? When we develop a new technology or a new digital capability, do we find that that our customers are actually using it, that they're embracing the technology, that it's making them feel more comfortable in their day-to-day financial lives. You know, I often use the saying, people think about money and we think about new technologies and we think about the use of data and analytics to know our customers. And you always hear the buzzword hyper-personalization. But when it comes right down to it, money is a really personal and emotional thing. 
for our clients, whether I'm a small business owner and I'm really proud of what I built and I want to make sure I can sustain it, whether I'm a customer and I'm thinking about my child going off to college and how am I going to afford that? So we really try to focus on that fact that money is really personal and emotional for our customers. And how do we develop all of our ecosystem and all of our experiences around that fact so that we can help them in their in their day-to-day lives and in their financial lives over time when it matters? Is there a difference between the online experience and the retail experience from this perspective of placing the customer at the center and really understanding the customer? No, I mean, it has to be a cross channel. So I think about digital as one component of that customer experience. And there are times when customers want things to be fully digital. At, often that's in their transactional needs, right? It's it's super easy to take a picture of a check and not have to go into a branch if I'm just looking to deposit a check I happen to receive. Um, but then there are times when I want that deep advice. We use the my child going to college example. I mean, I want to talk to someone to say, what are my options? How do I think about this important investment? How do I save over time for it? And we see our branches and our digital channels and our contact centers all playing a, a sort of symbiotic relationship on how they think about serving those customers across channels. What about developing the the processes and the technologies that you need in order to weave this together to create that seamless continuum that you've been describing? That's really why we embarked on our agile transformation two years ago is to make sure, and, and we have we changed the lexicon for those of you who know a lot about Agile, but we we have experience owners versus product owners with that exact intention in mind. So something like personalized um, insights that come in our mobile app are actually being delivered through a team that has people that are branch focused and have grown up in that environment throughout time. We have customer experience designers. We have digital designers. We have a real test and learn capability. We have analytics because to know an insight about you, we actually have to be able to look at some of the data and what we see happening so that we can cross channel as we help you with those insights. And and I think a really good example of it is Citizens launched uh, what we were calling peace of mind uh, this year. And that's really about if you overdraft, right? If you have that mistake, Citizens gives you 24 hours to be able to, uh, you know, repair that, to transfer money from one account to another or have something come in so that you don't actually have that oops that so many of us don't like if you think about that experience. Well, that's a completely cross-channel experience. So you're able to, you know, um, move money either digitally or go into a branch and do that. We send you a text alert that says, hey, Beth, did you know that you overdrafted? And therefore, um, I have this time to move money before anything happens to me. I get an alert in my mobile app. And, and if I call the contact center, they'll say the same thing. So to me, digital transformation or that customer experience is weaving everything together there. And, and, and I use this example because I really like it. I also call it the Beth doesn't like to be stupid example. So the money is emotional and the money is personal side of that is, you know, I'm a banker. I was a math major um, in training. I consider myself to be, you know, pretty good with uh, my finances. So I feel dumb, right, if I overdraft. Um, and maybe it's because my husband moved money the day before and then I'm just mad at him, right? So, so what this enables me to do is have an experience where I don't actually have to have that happen. And I know Citizens has my back and they have it in a digital transformation way, but it involves all channels and all capabilities. You now mentioned the term digital transformation. And so where does that weave into this? I mean, think about the way we operate in our daily lives. I mean, digital transformation has happened whether we like it or not. Uh, You know, we spend two hours a day on average on that mobile device that each of us has. We do more research than ever before when we're going to buy something because it's easy to get content and knowledge and understand it digitally. Um, We're able to streamline processes because, you know, we don't actually have to manually move paper from one place to another. We can do it through digital channels. So to me, digital transformation is just about acknowledging the way these new technologies have impacted and changed our lives and enabling us to do things no matter what channel it is, right? What we're doing now is digital transformation. We're on a, a Zoom call from different locations talking to people all over the country. 
It's acknowledging that. And that's why I think it is the customer experience and just ensuring that we use digital transformation to have better experiences for our customers. Let's jump to a few questions. I love taking questions from the audience. The audience is such a smart audience. And we have a question from Elazar. And Elazar says, what do you feel are the top three ways that help citizens meet its customer goals on a high level? So that so the top ways that the activities you're engaged in are really supporting what your customers are fundamentally trying to accomplish. I think the first thing um, is, is this um, feedback loop systems that we started to talk about at the very beginning. So we've invested in the ability to put in place uh, listening posts across both our commercial businesses and our consumer businesses to know how our customers are feeling based on how they're interacting with us and, and, and be able to adjust on the fly. So our head of wealth, for example, has a tool where daily he'll get comments from customers to pop up on his on his mobile app, right? So it is digital in a way. And he can hit a button and directly reach back out to a wealth advisor to say, hey, you need to follow up with this. Great job or great job, right? But it's super simple tools and it's directly based on what we're hearing from our customers. So I think that's critically important as I think about learning from our customers. I think the second one I, you know, I think about is really investing in the capabilities to do robust A-B testing and learning from our customers every day. So we built three or four years ago what we call Green Pixel Studios. You probably see the green behind me, Citizens Color is Green, um, which is our design studio. So we're able to think about how do we develop solutions for our customers that are laser focused on a customer problem and then test it in the lab, and then test it with panels online, and test before we build. So we're really efficient and focused on the customer. We've even invested in a lab in the building I'm in here um, in our consumer headquarters in Massachusetts so that we can bring customers in and test and learn from them. So that's a critical component of how I think on that customer transformation. And then the last piece we've really invested in is the insight side. So, so customers, and we're finding today, they're just overwhelmed with information. There's a stat that customers now, consumers, all of us, we have to make 35,000 decisions a day. So just let that sink in for a second. On average now, in the U.S., a consumer is making 35,000 decisions a day, whether that's in their business life and they're a business customer at the time or at home. That cognitive load is only increasing. And what we found is we needed to invest in tools. And and that's really on the analytics side and the data side to be able to offer those insights that make it easier to make some of those simple decisions so that cognitive load just decreases. Um, You know, it's such a silly little simple one, but one for me that was a surprise and delight. And, and, you know, I'm a power user of our own own tools. Um, I just got a little alert that said, hey, your refund's been processed. I didn't even remember necessarily that I had sent something back, but, you know, we all order online and I sent something back and then to immediately know it was there in my bank account. I didn't have to think about it. I didn't have to check on it. So it's those little insight tools and that insight and and personalization we're finding is really powerful. So really understanding what customers want at each point in their set of interactions with you in that customer journey and then trying to be responsive to that. That's that that's another way of saying that. Well, that's at the highest level, right? I think you always have to be really thoughtful on what customers want. By the way, sometimes we don't know, right? Which is why you can't just ask customers, what do you want? You actually have to observe them and test and learn from them by how we behave as people versus by necessarily what we say we're going to do as people. And we have a question from Alex Forbes who's complaining in general about phone-based customer experience and in general how terrible it is. And he's wondering if Citizens is doing anything to just to help the customer experience for people who have an immediate concern. There are two ways to answer that question. The first is absolutely. We're always investing in tools for our contacts and our agents so that they can be more responsive to our customers to make it easier to answer questions, to do it faster. 
um, to make it available to do things with chat instead of necessarily having to wait for a live agent. And that could be live chat or, or a chat bot that's digitally enabled. So I think it's critically important to think about your contact center as an important way that our customers interact with us. Um, and then I'd say the longer term thing is what we're really trying to focus on is understand why do people call our contact center and how many of those things should be done through digital channels simply so that they don't need to call. And so we can reserve our agents for those conversations that are a little bit trickier when our clients really need us. So we can get to them faster. We can spend more time um, and do it efficiently because we've taken some of the noise out of the system on things like, you know, the classic one is online password reset. You'd be shocked at the number of people who call, even though we do have the capability, they call to reset their password. We want to make sure our customers know they can do that digitally and free up that time for our agents on other things. And this is from Anshuman Das, Das, who asks, do you have any thoughts regarding customer experience using the metaverse? One of the things my team tends to look at here on innovation, we get lots of conversations right now in the metaverse, lots on, on crypto is the other, I think, hot topic. So when I think about the metaverse, I think it's going to be an area to test and learn. And so as citizens and some other financial institutions have already made investments, we are starting to think about how should we be facilitating experiences in the metaverse? Should we be dipping our toe in to understand different interaction models and what interaction models financial services uh, should play? In, in, in fact, just yesterday, our CFO actually asked someone on my team to come back with a proposal on exactly how we'll do that. So, so I think it's got to be top of mind for everybody because and we just talked about how much time our customers are spending online. And if that becomes, you know, Internet 3.0 and that's in the metaverse, we better understand how citizens should play a role in that. So a question from Twitter, Arsalan Khan asks, what do you think about trust? How do you create trustworthy customer experiences? It's an interesting question. I think you got to know your customer. You know, it's such a buzzword to use the word personalization right now, but I think trust is about knowing your customer, what their needs are, being personal to them, and then being with them in good times and bad. We actually saw all of our customer experience scores go up during COVID, and that was because we supported our commercial clients. We talked to everyone. We supported our consumers with internet hubs. We built that trust because we stayed with them in a cross-channel way during a difficult time as well as in the good times. And we have a question from Viraj Shah, who actually works for CXO Talk. I'm delighted he's watching. And he says, how do you measure customer experience? It's a great, great question. We measure it in several ways. So I said earlier, we do use net promoter scores as a fundamental tool to understand what our customers are thinking about us. So for those of you who don't know, that's the likelihood to recommend question. So would you recommend citizens uh, to a friend or colleague? And, and uh, you know, nine to 10 is a promoter. Zero to six is a detractor. The net score is you take the promoters minus the detractor. So we use that tool extensively. And then we also look at the outcome metrics. So are we growing our customer base? Are they doing more with us? Are we seeing them stay, you know, sort of stay with citizens and, and voting with their wallet? So I would say we use both that NPS score as well as these outcome metrics to measure customer experience. This is from Vincent Tran, who asks, what are the challenges you see for citizens as the world and as banking embrace an ever more digital approach to anything. So I think it's the the challenges associated with digital transformation, ultimately. I think the biggest challenge is cultural. So how do you make sure that people in the organization, that you combine the best of digital sort of capability and learning and bringing in that talent from the outside with people who've been in banking for a long time and really drive a culture of innovation and a culture of test and learn and a culture that understands data and analytics? Because, you know, digital moves fast and we've got to be focused on how do we innovate? How do we keep adding to those experiences for our customers? How do we compete with new entries? that might be coming into our space, but uh, but don't have the trust, going back to our trust comment that we do as a bank. And so we're constantly looking at training and culture and capability. HR has become one of my best friends as we think through this transformation in a way I actually hadn't thought through two years ago before we you know embarked on some of our changes. 
So HR has become uh, your friend, and I'm assuming that that implies the importance of talent in what you're doing. Yeah, we are absolutely at a war for talent. There's no question that in the capabilities that I have on my team and that we're driving for transformation, they're industry agnostic. So we've got to be able to attract the best and brightest, you know, digital engineering talent, uh, product ownership in the digital space, uh, social media, whatever it is we're thinking about in this organization. And we need to do that because we're innovative, because you know these people like to build stuff, because we're building things that are highly relevant for our customers and cool. Um, we got to do a lot of training. We got to do a lot of you know different tools and, and tricks to really have an organization that's a talent magnet and that we can keep folks excited about their careers over time. A big part of digital transformation involves changing processes, rethinking the job descriptions. That, of course, weaves in the talent aspect that you were talking about earlier. Can you connect the dots for us between customer experience and this aspect of digital transformation, right? Rethinking processes, rethinking business models, rethinking roles, things like that. The way we approached it is we launched what we call, um, it's really our agile transformation, which I talk about as the how, which is sort of innovative, engaged talent as a component of that. And we talk about it as a modern operating model. So it really starts with that deep customer experience. What problem am I trying to solve? But then how do we bring together in pods that can test and learn based on that towards a specific outcome solutions for our customers? And, and that could be a product-oriented person. It could be a process engineer, as you mentioned, Michael. So how do we stream the processes? It could be a digital engineer. It could be a marketing person. Um, a great example of that for citizens is in our home equity business. We've launched this year what we're calling our fast line, home equity fast line. That's essentially enabling you to do a home equity loan in under 10 days. And the industry is around 35 Because if I want to remodel my kitchen, by the way, I want to start tomorrow. I don't want to start 35 days from now while I get that home equity loan. That takes all those components. It takes a really deep understanding of the analytics. I have to rethink my pricing models. I have to rethink my um, processes in my back end versus my front end and how I underwrite. So by linking it all together in these cross-functional teams towards that common outcome is how we've approached it. And that's really the foundation of our transformation. I just want to remind everybody, subscribe to our newsletter, hit the subscribe button at the top of CXOTalk.com so we can keep you up to date. Okay, we have a question from Anne Young, and she says, how are you differentiating citizens from some of the challenger banks and fintechs? Our customers still value that holistic approach to banking that we just talked about. So that ability to be there during the good times and the bad, and we've proven that, that trust factor that we just talked about without saying trust me because that never works. Um, And then being able to really think about when are those in-person interactions really important? I mean, nobody's really cracked the code in the US to not, whether a commercial bank or a consumer bank, to not enabling those personal interactions when they matter to be that primary uh, partner for, for customers. So we really want to weave all that together. Our brand promise is all about that, which is a little bit distinct, is uh, made ready. But think about that as the marathon. So we, we explain it as in today's culture, you love to take that picture at the end of the marathon where you look great and you look happy and you don't even look like you ran. But we all know along the way, there was some pretty ugliness in times at times. And Citizens is really there for you throughout that time. And we use digital tools and capabilities to facilitate that. But that's foundationally who we are who we are as a bank, which has resonated. And we've had really outsized growth over the last couple of years, I think, by sticking to that. Is it possible to say, uh, to describe the impetus behind this real rethinking that's taken place inside citizens? Is it external factors in the environment? Is it competition? Is it the need for innovation? I think we foundationally think about it as the need for innovation, but that's, of course, driven by the pace of change um, of technology, the pace of change of our customers, what's happening with competitors. This is a market where we believe you have to be innovative and you have to be using new technologies um, effectively to, to compete 
but at its foundation. And I believe innovation is all about solving those customer problems when I say that. So that's how it all links together for us. What about data? You've described personalization. You've spoken about that. You've mentioned hyper-personalization earlier. Where does data fit into your world with this? I almost separate. There's the data and how do you make sure how you're architecting your data across your uh, company to be able to get access to it, have it be clean, um, have people drive insight from it. And then some of those deep analytics that can sit on top of it and, and scaling that. I think both are critically important. I think we're in a world where where individuals or corporations want you to have highly tailored advice to them. And that's about knowing how to use the data effectively to provide really deep insight. Um, We actually do a customer experience uh, survey each year in banking. And by the way, our customers on the whole say they're happy to have us use their data if we can do it in a way that's highly um, helpful to them. But by the but then the last piece of this, which I always say is the modeling is almost the easy part. You know, if I know that Beth has a senior in high school, which I do, and that might be going to college, and I have to start thinking about how do I finance that college, I can figure that out pretty easily in our data. But then I have to know how to get that information into the hands of something that will be helpful to me. And that's an integration to our mobile app or to texting or to email or to our branches, or to, you know, Salesforce. So an RM can can contact me. So you've got to have both the deep information and analytics, but it's got to be piped into your systems so that you can actually do something relevant for the customer with it. So it's not just data for the sake of collecting data, but it's thinking about the data with some endpoint and uh, usage scenario in mind. Is that a correct? We always start use case and work back. So I think that's exactly right. You've got to be focused on what's going to provide the most value to the customer and then go backwards. So that home equity example I gave our Fastline product, that was all based in the need that that person wanted to do their kitchen in seven days start, not in 35 days. But it's really a data and analytics use case on how we, yes, we needed digital. Yes, we needed to redesign our processes, but it's the flowing of the analytics and data across that enables that whole, that whole use case. Arsalan Khan on Twitter comes back again, and he says, when you're talking about digital transformation, how do you know when enough transformation has taken place? Is there such a thing as too much digital transformation? I don't think digital transformation is going to slow down. I do think you have to, it's not about the cool technology, right? Digital transformation is not about technology. It's about enabling um, enabling things to happen more effectively or better with less of that cognitive load than, than without it. So I think you're going to continue to see it. Somebody asked the metaverse question. That's going to be part of digital transformation in the future, you know, what's interesting, though, is if you look at, you know, why people buy in my business and financial services, particularly customers, it's not the digital capabilities on the whole. Those are kind of becoming table stakes. We all have them. It's the insights you can put on top of it, or it's the differentiators that you put on top of it. So I think you'll continue to see digital as a tool, as the technology changes, and that's what will differentiate as it's part of these experiences. This is from Peter Jones, and he asks, uh, this is a really, really good one. He says, we've spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to present the next best offer to get through all of the noise that you mentioned, Beth. He says, what thoughts do you have on cutting through the noise so the client actually engages and considers the offer? Like, this is the magic holy grail question that everybody wants to know. How do you get people to actually listen? My advice would be a couple things. One, you better have a next best offer generation engine that actually makes it truly a next best offer and not a next best offer for you, but a next best offer for the customer. Because I think that's one. It has to be highly relevant and it actually has to be surrounded by the content, depending on what that is, that's going to make the customer confident in that that recommendation and that it's relevant for them. I think the second component is having that be multi-channel in nature. It may be that I do best when you, you know, you sort of pop that offer up in the mobile app when I look at it every day. Michael, you might never go to the mobile app. So so I better think about is email more representative to you, or should I have someone pick up the phone and call you with that offer? I think that's where the nuances come in. It's got to be relevant. You've got to have the surrounding processes around it, and you got to tailor it to the right channel. 
Um, I have seen data, by the way, too many offers is also bad. Like we just, you know, if you start to bombard people, then they get overloaded and that that doesn't work well either. And Arsalan Khan comes back again and he says, okay, does digital transformation have limits on the kind of data to collect, the, you know, figuring out which processes to improve or not? I think what he's, he's getting at here is you cannot do everything in the universe. So how do you figure out where to focus? You know, we do it two ways. We, we look at what matters most to our customers. So that's where the deep customer research comes in and we focus on those processes or we haven't talked as much about it or we look at how we drive efficiency because that, that enables us to invest in areas of innovation where you know, which will deliver for our customers. So for example, in our contact center, someone asked that question earlier, we look at all the reasons for calling, right? We have the data to say, why are people calling us? Do we think that's something they should be calling us for? And then how do we make sure we have the digital capabilities if it may makes more sense to self-serve or we let them know and that they know about it, right? And that it's truly easier for that capability. So we kind of use either that kind of deep customer needs or we'll look at those operational characteristics to, to prioritize. Another question from LinkedIn. This is from Alex Ford, Alex Forbes again. And he wants to know, how are you incorporating machine learning into your digital experiences to ensure that unconscious bias is not built into your machine learning models? It's a very tricky conversation, particularly in banking. Remember, we're a highly regulated industry, so we're very thoughtful about where we um, deploy our machine learning models and in what ways to ensure that we don't have bias in the system. And then how do we back test to make sure where we have deployed, we don't have biases in the system. So particularly in a bank, there's going to be no black box machine learning. That's that's just not a good, good idea. But there are ways we can still uh, deploy it. So for example, in our personalization engine, the machine can learn whether Beth likes email or Beth likes texts or Beth, you know, responds more to something in the mobile app versus Michael. Do I like the color yellow versus the color red? Those kinds of things we're starting to deploy to make sure that we're most effective in the way we communicate to the people we communicate to. So that's a you know, good use case for us. Um, in some areas like fraud and collections, we have good ML use cases, but we're very, very careful on that bias question and have processes in place to, to guard against it. On the subject of data, what about the, the privacy aspect? It's so tempting to use yeah. that data to do that personalization and just to push it. So how do you, how do you Put restraints Similarly in. Similarly to ML, you know, we are a highly regulated bank. We take data privacy incredibly seriously. So we have a lot of different systems um, and capabilities in place to ensure the integrity of our data, to ensure the privacy of our data, to enable customers to understand how we use it. As I said, what's interesting is many customers, you know, don't mind using data if you can provide them something that's, you know, sort of prereq, you know, that's um, valuable for it. But, uh, but we do have all those systems in place and, and we spend quite a bit of money uh, to ensure that we have cybersecurity, data security, sort of teams of people to monitor our usage of data. As we finish up, can you share advice for folks that are looking at this type of digital transformation slash customer experience journey? And can you describe what are the factors, some of the factors that make it successful? How to make it work? I think overcoming the hurdle that they're two different things and starting with the premise that customer experience journey and digital journey, they're really all one part of one ability to have those great experiences or overcome roadblocks for your customers. And that's job one. And then I would never underestimate, we touched on it during this, but the cultural aspects of a transformation like this in companies that aren't you know, necessarily digitally native or new, which is how do you make sure you instill um, the, the police systems, the foundations, the training, the build mentality, the ability to test and learn into the ways you manage your people, you motivate, you, you, know, you reward, you compensate. All of those different cultural aspects are really, really important to focus on, to get right, and to invest in. You mentioned the culture as being maybe the most significant challenge. Why is that? Because it's new. 
And, and, you know, banks that have been around in particular for a long time sometimes struggle a bit with new. It, it was an industry that was a little bit slower to change than some others. But I think absolutely critical that we do and we acknowledge it. And innovation is so important in our industry to meet those customer needs. But we have to push the culture to get to that place of innovation. And I think Citizens has done a really good job at it. But you have to be explicit. You have to invest in it. You have to make sure your reward systems enable it. Um, And so that's what's been so critical for us is to make that push towards innovation in an industry that frankly didn't for, you know, probably 20 years and now is accelerated with the tools available. And finally, where is all this going for citizens? Our goal is to just continue to be the um, best bank to help our clients through their through their journey, whether that's a business or or a consumer. We want to be the trusted advisor. We want to grow those businesses. I think that's going to enable us to be successful and to outperform our competition. All right. And with that, we are out of time. This has been a whirlwind show. A huge thank you to Beth Johnson, who is the Chief Experience Officer at Citizens Financial Group. Beth, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. I really, really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me, Michael. And a huge thank you to everybody who asked such amazing questions. Now, before you go, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit the subscribe button at the top of our website so we can send you our newsletter. Check out CXOTalk.com. We have incredible shows coming up and we will talk with you soon. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.